If you think it's hard to be a conservative in America, I want you to take a look at the PRC, the secret police, arresting journalists for asking questions. Local politicians are targeting Christians for their beliefs. The country's leader is waging legal warfare against protesters and even froze their bank accounts. This is life in the PRC. But I'm not talking about the People's Republic of China. It is the People's Republic of Canada. We need to pay attention because our neighbors to the north are always just a few steps ahead of us on things like this. And the Trudeau regime, the crackdown on the press, is one of the most disturbing examples in the world. Nearly every media outlet has fallen in line, except for one. For years now, the Trudeau regime has had rebel news in its sight. It's very much like the blaze in Canada. But instead of bending the knee, they're fighting political warfare with legal warfare. So with Democrats promising to crack down on your freedoms in the name of democracy, I wanted to get some advice from one of Canada's most fearless freedom fighters. Please welcome my dear friend. Rebel News founder and owner, Ezra Levant. First, did you know that we see with our brain and not our eyes? Our brain constantly senses what's happening all around you. And how and what we see not only depends on the strength of our eyes, but it also helps the brain make optimal decisions. This is why you need as much field of vision and peripheral vision as possible. Vision is so important to humans that almost half of your brain's capacity, 25% of our day's energy, is dedicated to your sight and visual perception. Rodenstock. They have biometric intelligent glasses. Your brain will adapt to them nearly instantly. You don't have to go home and get used to your new glasses. They're actually, when you put them on the first time, it's relaxing. Your eyes, you could feel it. And it's like a hot knife through butter. You'll have seamless visual experiences no matter where you look. Visual acuity unlike you've experienced since wearing glasses. Biometric intelligent glasses with artificial intelligence from Rodenstock at Better Spectacles. Go now to betterspectacles.com slash Beck. Schedule your teleoptical appointment and get your glasses now for 61% off. Betterspectacles.com slash Beck. My brother from another mother. How are you? <laughs> good. I'm good. You know, it's you, been a challenging little while, but uh, we're fighting back. Um, most people don't know this, um, I think, but. Um, we kind of have a parallel path in some ways. You're much more well educated than I am, but uh, you you started a media company, um, and you were on cable and everything else, and they kind of pounded the humor out of you. Uh, and your job is becoming more and more serious all the time, and you really, unlike Unlike us, when we first started, we were alone, but now others have joined us because of the way Canada is. You're really alone, really alone. There's a couple of other small independent startups, but really you can count them on one hand, and uh, they're really being targeted. It's, let me use a metaphor. If there's 100 candles in a room and you snuff out five of them, it's still pretty bright. You snuff out 50, it's starting to get a little dimmer. You snuff out 90, it's, it's getting pretty dark. And each candle you snuff out is more and more important. And if there's two candles left, you snuff out one of them. You've just cut the, the light in half. But that last candle, it's all the difference between light and dark. And, and the analogy I'm making is Trudeau has colonized 80, 90, 95, 99% of the media. But in a way, he rages against that last candle the most, because if he can't snuff it out, what was the point of, of snuffing out the first 99? Right. And 
There are so few independent journalists in Canada, and it's so tiny. Like, we're tiny. But his rage gets angrier and angrier with every year. He's bringing in strange things. The government's bringing in a code of conduct for news journalists. The government is. I know. I want to talk about that in a minute. But can we start with the latest? Uh, One of your reporters, Menzies, I think. Yeah, David Menzies. and I've seen him many times. Seems like a nice, affable guy. Great guy. Um, and he is uh, just on the street, just asking a question. Yeah. Um, legitimate question. Tell the story. Sure. David Menzies is uh, early 60s. He's, he's not threatening. He's not mean in any way. Very polite. Wears a fedora. Mm-hmm. He's sort of old school shoe leather journalist. Um, he went to a vigil for victims of an Iranian terrorist attack. The Islamic Republican Guard Corps shot down a commercial airliner, killing hundreds of people, including more than 50 Canadians. So there's a large Persian community in Canada that was mourning the anniversary of that. So our guy, David Menzies, went there, and he saw the deputy prime minister walking into the vigil. But Canada refuses to call the Islamic Republican Guard Corps, I, IGRC, uh, or IRGC, refuses to call that a terrorist group, refuses to designate and a it terrorist group. is one of the most recognized terrorist groups. Yeah, and so it, it's such a paradox because Canada has been so wounded by them. Uh, there was a report that there are 700 um, IRGC uh, operatives working in Canada, and it's legal. So our guy Menzies bumped into the deputy prime minister at this vigil. And as she was walking in, he just walked up to her with a microphone. He was clearly a reporter and said. Very, very polite. Yeah. I mean, he he was, uh, he didn't swear. He didn't touch her or crowd Mm -hmm. her. He just put the microphone to her and said, why won't you ban this terrorist group? And, And then he asked a second time, why are you allowing these Islamic Nazis to go unchecked. I mean, they weren't perfect questions, but he put, but they were fair questions. Mm-hmm. This deputy prime minister's bodyguard swarmed David, smacked him up against the wall, and said, "You're under arrest for assault." And he said, "What? What?" You? And and then they handcuffed him and they frog marched him to a, a police car and they drove him away. And the thing is, all the cops at once said. You assaulted. You, 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 we, we saw your assault. You were pushing people. You were being aggressive. And they all said this at the same time, except we caught it all on tape and none of that happened. None of it happened. None of it happened. It, is, it, it was, it's one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. And not because of the one cop, but because, as you said, all the cops, they all went along. And you can see on the tape, he's just walking the um, uh, the assistant prime minister or deputy prime minister um, steps a different way. So he's kind of f- shadowing her in a way he's backing up. He only brushes shoulders with with her security. OK, mounted police. And it's because that guy who's looking at him doesn't move. Yeah, it's worse than that. This bodyguard sort of moves into place so that. David will brush up against him. And it was just a brushing up. You're under arrest for assault. And the facility, the ease, the the, the calmness with which they all said, you did it. We all saw you did it. We all saw you assaulted them. That's what was so shocking. I mean, arresting a reporter is sort of shocking. But the instant lies of the RCMP, and if it, that's the Royal Canadian mm-hmm. Mount of Police, and if we didn't have it on tape, absolutely, David would be in jail right now. And this is the second time that Royal Canadian Mount of Police bodyguards have done this to David. A couple of years ago. Are they like our Secret Service? Yes. That, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the Mounties or the RCMP, yeah, yeah, yeah. they have a special d- detail that yeah. protects right. the VIPs. Mm-hmm. During the, Canada had really harsh lockdowns during the pandemic. And I remember one Christmas a couple of years ago, Trudeau said, do not have your family over do, for Christmas. Do not have family gatherings. It was, it was terrible. Bulky, that's the rules. But then Trudeau had a, a $1,700 ahead, which is the maximum you can give in Canada, Christmas fundraiser at a restaurant. Hang oh on. Oh, my God. You just said we... So our guy, David Menzies, shoe leather reporter, stands outside the restaurant in the snowy cold for an hour waiting for Trudeau to arrive. And he's going to holler one question. And he's not going to get an answer, but it'll be, why are you here when we can't have... 
and he was waiting outside the restaurant with the local Toronto police for an hour. It was just him, our cameraman, and the local Toronto cops waiting in the snow for an hour for Trudeau to arrive. They all knew David. He's wearing his fedora. Um, they, they see him around everywhere. He's harmless. And he's bantering with the local cops mm-hmm. for one hour. Trudeau's SUVs pull up. The whole entourage pulls up. They jump out and they beat him up. They smash him against the wall. They drop him to the ground. They pound him. He's stunned. He's clearly, his head was jostled. He he can't speak clearly. They just drop him and leave. No charges. And I'm certain that the the cops, the bodyguards in the entourage radioed ahead to the local cops and said, Breaker, breaker, what's going on over there? They said, oh, nothing. Just one David Menzies from Rebel News. Oh, because I'm because the cops, the local cops were fine with him. He's a, he's a 60 something reporter with two artificial hips. He's a threat to nobody. But they jumped out and they beat him up. And this, the, our reporters are assaulted regularly during the trucker convoy. Mm-hmm. Completely peaceful protest. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of truckers in, in Ottawa. There was one shooting. The RCMP shot our reporter, Alexa Lavoie, in the leg with a riot gun, which is not meant to be used against... You don't shoot at 10 feet. point. A a huge... Like, it wasn't a bullet, but it was like a wadding of a... they, They knew who she was. We're suing them. They knew who she was. They knew her by name. They gave her no first aid. They shot her and left her. We, we read the police notes of that day. They were giving first aid all over town, except for the one person they shot. What's the odds that the only shooting in the whole police con, the only person shot was our reporter? That's three times. And I, and I know I'm sounding paranoid, but I tell you, no. this, remember who Justin Trudeau is. He's the son of Pierre Trudeau, who was the communist. Pierre Trudeau took his young boys to the Soviet Union. When it was still the Soviet Union, he said, this is the future, he, t- he said to them. He took his young sons to communist China before it even had any free market reforms. And when Justin Trudeau was running for prime minister, he was asked an unprompted question. He was asked, what country do you most admire? That's actually a great question, mm-hmm. isn't it? And he said, China. Okay, there could be good answers for that. Chinese food, Chinese history, mm-hmm. Chinese architecture, Chinese... There's a lot to admire about China, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. But the odious thing about China is its dictatorship. But here's the verbatim quote. He said, China, comma, because of its basic dictatorship. Trudeau has told us who he is. He... he remember when his father died, Castro came and was a pallbearer for mm-hmm. Pierre Trudeau. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, it was the other way around, right? When his father died, then Pierre came in and carried Castro's casket, right? <laughs> you know what? I I think Pierre died first. No, I but I know, but I but who's his dad? <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> you know, the the pictures of a young Justin Trudeau and a young Fidel Castro are oh, yeah. uncanny. And Pierre Trudeau and his young, beautiful wife, mm-hmm. Margaret Trudeau, mm-hmm. vacationed in Cuba all the time. Oh, they were and there are so many Very pictures, close. Very handsy, as the kids yes. say. Very handsy. Yes. And I, I'm not here willing to say uh, categorically that Justin Trudeau is actually genetically the son of Fidel Castro. But I'm here to say that Fidel Castro it was certainly a father figure in terms of ideology. And Justin Trudeau... How, how, how did this... How is it Canadians, who are different, yes, they're different than Americans. You know, we don't have... Uh, you know, we, we, we never liked government involved in everything. Um, and you pretty much embrace that as Canadians, most. Um, we eat regular bacon. You have Canadian bacon. <laughs> but beyond that, we've always been very similar. Yeah. You are going down a road that is including infanticide now. You're offing your elderly, yeah. the depressed, yeah. the handicapped. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is terrifying what's happening. Where's the average Canadian or do they just not see it? I, I think that a few things. We have a real problem with checks and balances in Canada. We don't have a system that is designed 
to counter itself, as you do here. And so prime ministers can act, for example, the Supreme Court. Here you have debates over, you have votes over, you have public hearings. It's not a slam dunk. (laughs) In Canada, the prime minister just says, ta-da, here's your new Supreme Court judge. It's it's a fait accompli. That's Mm. one example. The media... Canada used to have, well, I wouldn't say it was a robust media, but we, we did have an independent critical media. In the last eight years, Justin Trudeau has used both carrot and stick. I mentioned some of the actual sticks mm-hmm. they used against, Your against journal. yeah, mainly Rebel News journalists. It's, you know, I happen to be the boss of Rebel News. That's not the only reason I'm saying it. Our reporters are beat up regularly. We our, our, One of our largest expenses is security for our journalists, but security will not protect you against police. Security put their weapons down when police come. So that's the stick, but there's the carrot. What if if I was asked, Ezra, how would you subvert the First Amendment? I wouldn't come with a stick. Mm-hmm. I would come with a carrot. Mm-hmm. And I would say, hey, publishers, it's pretty tough out there these days in the media business. Mm-hmm. Facebook and Google are really taking all your dough. We'll help. Will subsidize. And through that gentle corruption of financial colonization, 99% of Canadian journalists have their salaries subsidized by Trudeau. It's about 35% right now, but it's going up. So if you take money from Trudeau and report on Trudeau, even if it's just subconsciously, you're going to pull your punches. And you're, certainly your publisher is going to nix. Any, anything that's too inflammatory, that would undermine press independence more than a stick. In fact, a stick might get journalists to remember their independence, to remember their principles. But if, if you just say, well, it's so tough out there, you need the government to help you. And so they bring in journalism licenses. In Canada, they're doing that. They're calling the Qualified Canadian Journalism Organization. You have to apply to our version of the IRS for a news license. This is, this is, Ted Koppel talked to me about this, and I I told him I was horrified by Ted Koppel saying this. He said, you know, the problem is, is that uh, people who are not qualified to be journalists and commentators are commentators. And I said, well, who should decide, Ted? And he said, well, people like me. And I said, would people like me get a license? And he said, no. Who are you to say that? I I saw today that uh, the largest news organization in Canada is the state broadcaster called the CBC. They have a larger budget and more reporters than the rest of the media combined. Imagine that elephant in the room. So it's the BBC, same thing. Exactly. And because the rest of the media is in decline, every reporter is sort of saying, hmm, I might have to work for the state broadcaster one day, so let me tailor my coverage to be ideologically a fit. So not only do they distort uh, the media marketplace, but even the private sector journalists have one eye out for one. I might have to go to the CBC one day. But CBC's ratings, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, they're declining. Their national flagship newscast the other day had just 200,000 views in a country of 40 million people. Yeah, they get a billion and a half dollars a year, and only 200,000 people watch their flagship news because it's just liberal talking points. Where are Canadians getting their news? Well, they're getting it from Twitter and Facebook and citizen journalists. And that's that's what I mean about Trudeau. The more he controls the establishment media, the regime media, the media party, as I sometimes call it, the more people just go and find the news on their own from citizen journalists, which is ordinary people with a cell phone, just turn on your cell phone and tweet it. Ta-da, you're a journalist. Mm -hmm. And kids these days are great at editing things on their phones. Mm -hmm. A kid with a basic cell phone today can do what 10 years ago would have been a quarter million dollars worth of equipment and and a pro. And so... That's why Trudeau has to cut off the citizen journals because people are naturally just fleeing the crap of the state broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And here's here's one way he's doing it. He said to Facebook, you must pay the government for every time you link to a Canadian news source. You're stealing news. That's not how it is. Publishers love Facebook because it sends traffic to us. Facebook said, we're not going to pay a hundred million bucks. And remember, Canada is one tenth the Mm -hmm. size of the state. So it would be like saying to Facebook, pay a billion dollars a year. Facebook said, no, thanks. So they just turned off their news. They do not, they 
Facebook, because of this government demand, has turned off all news in Canada. Well, that hurts the independents. And Google is cutting some deal with Canada. They pay sort of 100 million bucks a year as some sort of protection money. But in a bill that was passed uh, last year called C-11, Justin Trudeau has given, given himself the power to alter the search and discoverability algorithms in the big tech companies. Oh, my gosh. Now, it's bad enough as it is. That, I mean, Rebel News is down, de-boosted, and the state broadcaster is boosted. Mm-hmm. That's already happening for ideological and corporate Correct. reasons. But Bill C-11 gives Justin Trudeau the power to alter the discoverability, that's the phrase they use, of all news in Canada. So put it all together. You've got your news license, your qualified Canadian journalism organization that's a, uh, a certification given out by the state. And now the state can tell Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, who to boost and de-boost. They don't have to ban Rebel News. They just have to deny us that news license. That, and, and the tech companies will do the rest. And, and it's just a slow strangulation. Sometimes it's a fast strangulation when, yeah. you, when you see them actually arrest our guys. They arrested David Mayer. They put him in the back. Why did they handcuff him? Because they wanted to show their domination over. Why did they march, frog march him? He's a 60-plus guy with two artificial lips. I'm not, I'm not being condescending to him. He was no risk. That's not a real police move. They did that because they wanted to show who's boss, and don't so you forget it. Do you think the Canadians... The average Canadian is waking up to that. Some of them are. I mean, I just saw a new poll today. Uh, Trudeau's the lowest ever. Um, among young people especially, what's interesting in Canada is Trudeau has the least support. The younger you get, the less support he has. Often in often socialist mm-hmm. parties, the youth are their strong suit. But in Canada, I, I think there's a few reasons for it. First of all, Trudeau comes across as a phony. He comes across as a feminist, but we learned that he sexually assaulted a woman uh, when he thought he could get away with it. He, he just said, oh, she experienced it differently. Uh, he, he portrayed himself as a friend to visible minorities, but then it was discovered that he would dress up in blackface more often than he could remember. He claimed to be a friend of indigenous people. He appointed the first uh, Aboriginal justice minister, and it was, she was wonderful, but when she called out some of his donors for corruption... He fired her. And oh, it, my gosh. And it, she was, her name was Jody wilson Rabel, the first Indian, or status Indian, mm-hmm. justice minister in Canadian history. It was a real moment of reconciliation and rapprochement. Imagine that, having an indigenous justice minister, just the feeling of healing. But she said, hang on, hang on, you're giving some of your corporate cronies. Like, Trudeau asked her to drop a prosecution of corruption. And she was, so, she was the most ethical justice minister in our country's history. She said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to let your guys off the hook. So he fired her as justice minister. How do you have a country yeah. with the, without protections against things like that? That's incredible. Oh. That you've, you haven't gone off the rails long before this you know and and for all the flaws in your american system you have independent senators and congressmen mm-hmm. that could have investigations you have inspectors general you you do have checks and balances we don't in canada and the reason i'm emphasizing the media is because sometimes the media acts as an official opposition mm-hmm. but what if the opposition doesn't oppose mm-hmm. and and I saw that a lot during the pandemics and the lockdowns. All the political parties in Parliament were the same, were agreed on all the core issues. And all the professors were silent. And all the colleges of physicians and surgeons were silent. No one fought back. It was a, you would be forgiven for thinking the entire country agreed with it. Mm-hmm. And, and they went so far during the lockdowns. There was a no-fly list if you weren't jabbed. You couldn't get on a plane or a train or a ferry in the country, the second largest country in the world. You couldn't if you weren't jabbed. I'm not talking about foreign flights or anything. I couldn't fly for two years. And, and the entire establishment said, oh, everyone supports this. That's, the truckers broke that false feeling of unanimity. The tr- so is that why the truckers are hated so much? It's like January 6th, yeah. you know what I mean? Trudeau tried that January 6th narrative on the truckers. Oh, he talks about Trump all the time. 
Trudeau does. And he says any critic is a MAGA Republican. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he said about the truckers is they're racist and sexist. In Canada, truckers are are largely visible minorities. There's a lot of indigenous people and a lot of Indo-Canadians, a lot of Sikh people. Mm -hmm. uh, Truckers are are not white in Canada, actually. It's just Mm -hmm. a thing. And so when he started, oh, you're all racist, it was sort of a laugh. And people said, what? And... And everyone loves truckers. They're honest. They're hardworking. No one has a beef with truckers. Truckers work so hard. And I know. R- during the early part of the of the pandemic, truckers kept us going. I know. Not just truckers, but Uber Eats and, yep. and all those things. It w- Those were the hardworking guys. And so when Trudeau turned on them and said, you've got to be jabbed or you can't drive a truck. What? They're the most solitary people in the world other than like a lighthouse keeper. <laughs> right. Why are you making these guys get a jab? And so it was It was such a wonderful moment. So we had been so locked down. It was so harsh. It was so demonized. You couldn't go into a restaurant. You couldn't, you couldn't go to school. You couldn't fly. Like it was so terrible. And then these truckers physically got on the road and drove to Ottawa. And it was miles and miles and miles of trucks. And people got out of their homes, put down their phones, unclicked the internet, and went to, to, to observe this with their own eyes on the overpasses of the country. I estimate that 100,000 people participated in one form or another in the convoy, whether it was just for a few miles or the whole way. But I think a million people actually got out of their homes and went to see it pass by because they they wanted to see if it was real as opposed to the propaganda that they were getting fed on their Internet. And it was such a real awakening. You know, Orwell said, the hope lies with the proles. That was his nickname for the proletariat. And that's what it was in Canada. All the experts, all the civil liberties experts who hit the snooze button for three years, all the fancy people, all the PhDs, all the MDs, they went silent. It was the proles. It was those working class truckers who saved the country. And they went to Ottawa and Trudeau said, "Uh uh-huh, this is the January 6th narrative. These guys are insurrectionists. He talked, he, he wanted to graft that American narrative onto Canada, except they were perfectly peaceful. They cleaned up Ottawa. They shoveled the snow. Mm -hmm. Crime fell in Ottawa. The only shooting, as I mentioned before, was the police shooting our reporter. And so, but the thing is, the media, the regime media, the subsidized media, they were, they believed that these were scary terrorists. So they didn't go down to meet the truckers. They wrote the stories from their offices and they would have carried out Trudeau's narrative were it not for citizen journalists. And I remember February of 2022 when the, when the convoy was at its peak. Little rebel news. We sent journalists out there and I just said, turn on your phone and live stream. You don't even have to talk. Just show us the reality of what's happening. And we had 400 million views and impressions in that month. For, we're so small, Glenn, but we were as large at that month as the state broadcaster because everyone said, I don't want to hear some pundit disparaging the truckers. Let me just see what it looks like. And we had we had kids working weeks and weeks without a break because they just, they knew that they were part of a historic moment. It was a peaceful Canadian style uprising. And it, Canada is normally so boring. Mm. It's so <laughs> vanilla. No one cares about Canada. And we sort of like it that way. But that one moment, I think the whole world sort of said, what's going on in Canada? And it was a visual feast. It was a spectacle, but it was so peaceful. I went to, to there for a few days. It had a festival feeling. People were unironically waving Canadian flags, just spontaneously singing the anthem. I have never seen that in my life. Canadians aren't like Americans. No, we don't, don't all fly flags on our houses. Right. We don't have lapel pins. We're not that showy about it. But that week, it felt that way. I felt like I was going to like a a patriotic Woodstock or something, and it was all races. And and Ottawa is just across the river from Quebec, the French-speaking place. And so you had all these French Canadians, and their English maybe wasn't so great, but it was beautiful. Imagine the feeling of all these French-speaking truckers coming and saying, you know, Viva Freedom or whatever it was. It was a beautiful feeling, and it took all the symbols of Canada, like they weren't anti-Canadian. And in fact, to this day, the regime media now says the word freedom and the Canadian flag are radical symbols. The Canadian flag is so being reconquered by the freedom people that now the Trudeau people look down on it. Isn't that amazing? But the truckers saved us. And, And I see now in Germany, 
the farmers and the truckers. Yeah. I think the Canadians actually set a bit of a template for others around the I world. I hope so. I hope so. And so I got to have hope, even though Canada is dark in many ways, there is hope and you got to keep going. And I had a lot of friends who moved to America during the lockdowns. Montreal, second largest city in Canada. There was a curfew from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. during during the pandemic. Sick or not, injected or not, you could be triple vaxxed and healthy. You could not leave your personal residence between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Do you know how many Canadians just said, I am out of here, and all went to Florida? I mean, there's a lot of French Canadians in Florida to begin with. And But you know what? We, we were able to, that was that marked the inflection point in the polls. When Trudeau brought in the War Measures Act, he, it's now called the Emergencies Act. Yeah. First time that law was ever used. It wasn't even used during 9-11. I know. Trudeau deployed a, a form of martial law, seized hundreds of bank accounts without legal process, jailed uh, some of the trucker leaders. And, and some of them are still in jail, are they not? Yeah, yeah, there's four of them. Now, they have some more serious charges against them. There's four of them have been in prison almost 700 days. It's sort of like the January Sixers. And, but slowly, these cases are working their way through court. We started a civil liberties charity called the Democracy Fund, took about 3,000 cases. Trudeau was fining people five, six thousand bucks if they didn't, if they returned to Canada and didn't declare their VAC status, if they didn't fill out some government app. Trudeau created a government app that to come back to your own country. You're a Canadian citizen, you're coming back to your own country. If you did not fill out a government app saying if you were jabbed or not, you would have a five or six thousand dollar fine. So a family of four, that's more than 20 grand in fines. What family of four can take that? And, and so we created the civil liberties charity called the Democracy Fund. And, and we just sort of said, we're going to take every case, not just one or two. We're going to take hundreds. In the end, we took 3,000 cases. And that jammed the system. In fact, we're, we're, uh, most of those cases, the prosecution is just said, we, we don't have the resources. And they've either dropped the cases or settled for a trifle. And there's a lesson there. If only one or two people had stood up, the state would have come down on them like a ton of bricks. But do you really have enough courthouses, enough judges, enough prosecutors to have 3,000 trials? So the very fact that an enormous number of people stood up and said, no, see you in court, as opposed to cowering and paying, the fact that so many people did it is, is the reason they won. And I mean, I'm telling you a lot of different related stories, but I, I believe in Canada. I have to. It's, it's my home, and I, I can't leave. I feel like I have to be the last one to leave. Right. I've, said, I've said I believe in it. I, I think I mean it. Our mission at Rebel News is to tell the other side of the story, but every once in a while we stop and do something, too. We crowdfund lawyers. We, we crowdfunded the lawyers for these 3,000 people I mentioned. I, I don't want to give up, and you've got to hope that people care. There's one caveat to that. What if Trudeau brings in millions of people from other countries that don't believe in freedom? Mm -hmm. That's my only worry. So here's the thing, because <clears throat> when you said, you know, I believe in Canada and I and I will stay in Canada, I think when you said that, my first thought was LGBTQ. You say something, anything that's not even disparaging. Yeah. You are under attack. Yeah. But extremists not the persians i'll bet yeah. you that persian community does not like the current regime oh no right very freedom oriented of course yeah. not um but you do have muslims we have in our country you have in yours not all muslims are the same right but there are those who are coming in who have ill intent want sharia law yeah. in their own no-go zone and right. eventually for the whole thing right you're jewish yeah you ever think of to yourself I've never understood why people didn't get out of Germany until now. I do have that thought. My whole life, I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a actually, uh, in the countryside. Um, I mean, I went to Jewish school in the city, but then I went to school in the country. I, and my sister and I were the only two Jews in a school of 400 kids. There was two Chinese kids, two black kids, and everyone else was <laughs> regular. And uh, what was it like being in rural Alberta, being the only Jewish kids? In, and I, it was wonderful. It was absolutely, the only thing people said is, 
tell me what it means to be Jewish. I mean, I, I had to be on my best behavior because I was sort of the symbol for <laughs> right. what it meant. And same with the black kids and the Chinese because we were, it was so wonderful growing up in Canada. My entire life, I never faced any anti-Semitism. Never for a second did I think there's nothing I, can, I can't do. And, and, I, and the idea of being unsafe, it never even dawned on me until the last three months. And the hate march is f- literally waving flags of the Taliban and Islamic Jihad and ISIS and masked people in, in the streets saying, I'll kill you. Like th- there was, this, there was a, a shopping center in downtown Toronto that hundreds of Hamas supporters went into, despite the police saying, don't go in, guys. They went in and there's this video of one guy saying, I'm going to put you six feet under. And he's dressed full mask, Hamas, and the cop is right next to him. There, there's a bridge near my house. There's, I live in a, a pretty Jewish neighborhood. The Hamas protesters are targeting that Jewish neighborhood. There's no embassy there. There's no offices uh-huh. there. There's just Jews. And there's a key bridge to get into the neighborhood. The Hamas protesters would block it. The police would come and officially block it. To, they, they, they didn't clear the protesters. They they taped off the streets so no one would try and go through. The other day, police brought hot coffee to the Hamas protesters on the bridge. That was caught on tape also. They were helping them. And so it's one thing to have bad actors. But when every single authority seems to be cool with it, what do you do? Toronto's got 200,000 Jews. That's a big Jewish population. Never in my life did I think they would be hunted. Every single day there's more crystal knock style mm-hmm. hate crimes. No 387% been... rise in hate crimes against Jews in, since October 7th. It, it's, I will admit I'm a little bit scared. I hate to say that because I don't want to appear weak and I don't want to show that they get into me. But when you, Justin Trudeau ha, has made a deliberate strategy to court the pro Hamas vote. At the United Nations a few weeks ago, he broke with Canadian tradition, broke with the United States, and voted to condemn Israel and demand an immediate ceasefire. Oh no gosh. mention of Hamas. That was the first time Canada's ever flipped sides. Trudeau has announced that he's going to take at least a thousand refugees from Gaza, but that there's no cap to that number. Even Arab countries will not take refugees from Gaza. 75% of Gazans tell pollsters that they support Hamas. How are you going to vet them? Are you going to ask the Hamas government if these people are terrorists or not? I am worried that Trudeau, partly for ideological reasons and partly because he believes they're his voter bloc, You've got immigration problems, but we do too. And Trudeau is courting the Hamas vote. That I am scared about that. I'll admit, I'm scared about that. I brought these in from the museum next door. You know what this is? Oh boy. Well, I see for the Jew, for the German. Police, what does this say? I, I don't know that first So word. this is this is the criminal code oh, wow. for the German police. Wow. But I thought it was relevant to you because of what I saw the RMC the the, the Royal Mounted Police, what they did to your reporter, and then what the local police did. What the local police did said, You you didn't do anything, get, get out of here. You're yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. This was the law. This is the way it was until the Gestapo really took power. Uh, Then it didn't matter. Right. This didn't matter at all. Right. My question to you is, how far away is Canada from this not meaning anything locally? And are we following in the same footsteps? A lot of good people were purged from institutions over the jab, from the military, from the police. And what do I mean by good people? I'm not talking about vax or anti-vax, just independent thinkers, critical thinkers, people who care about personal liberty, people who are not obedient and quick order followers. Mm -hmm. Kind of independent-minded, thoughtful people that you want as police. Mm -hmm. So across Canada, I think it happened a lot in the U.S. also. Oh, it did, yes. So... You forced out a lot of your best people, Mm -hmm. and the people who remained were either weak and were in no position to fight back, or they loved it ideologically, or they're just compliant people. 
So I think that a lot of institutions purged not only cultural memory of how to be free people, but the kind of people who in a pinch would say, no, that's wrong. Yeah, the, and, and, but only in medicine, uh, military, and police. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, and DEI, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, inclusion, which are terrible code words. We're seeing how bad that is. I think that's in every institution. It's in the police. And that's, I, I can't understand what, I mean, take it out of the Jewish-Palestinian conflict for a second and imagine if masked people, because they're wearing masks, but let's say they were wearing hoods instead of Hamas masks, blocked a road to a black neighborhood on the Sunday Sabbath when a black church was had, trying to meet and were chanting about lynchings. And, and the police were bringing them coffee and Justin Trudeau was saying, well, they're peaceful protesters. They're calling for, for the mass death of Jews. I don't know why it's excused when it's Jews. I mean, just flip it around. Put any other group mm -hmm. in there. I am worried because the police, I believe, have been DEI colonized. And prosecutors, I don't know. Have they been ordered to stand down or do they believe that this is fine? And, of course, you go from the law school, and we see how bad the schools are. Mm -hmm. You become a young lawyer, then you become a senior lawyer, a prosecutor, then you become a judge. And I'm worried that the more I, I study about cultural Marxism and critical theory, the more I realize that these are like termites in our mm -hmm. cultural foundation. Mm -hmm. It took us 30 years to get into this problem. It's going to take us 30 years to get out. I like what's going on with Bill Ackman and some of the battles over Harvard and because mm -hmm. it's shining a light on it. But boy, has, is the problem progressed. And, and the reason that affects the Jews is that in this critical race theory approach, all Jews are the oppressors. So anything is legitimate oh, against the oppressor Jew. Oh, I know. I, don't, I, I am worried. I, I, I feel like it's, it's dark days. I'm actually more worried about the West than I am worried about Israel. I think Israel can handle itself more yeah, or less. Israel will handle itself. It knows what happens if it doesn't. Yeah. It's the only place and the only time they've ever had. They didn't have to ask permission to stand up for themselves. Yeah. They are not going to lose that. You know, I, I, I said to Bibi Netanyahu, I want, I, I really, and I mean this, I want Israeli citizenship for me and my family. Huh. And he said, why would you want that? And I said, because I know you guys know who you are. Yeah who the bad guys are, yeah. and you'll stand. Right. I'd rather be with a group of people who are standing going, right. no, yeah. this is evil. Yeah. Even if we lose in the end, yeah. I want to stand. Yeah. And there's so many people that won't. Let me, let me ask you, let me turn this here for a second. There was um, a, uh, you're going to Davos next week. Not as an invited guest, as a, <laughs> as a very much uninvited guest. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about this um, because you have been relentless on this. Um, I've heard reporters say, I went and it was just boring. <laughs> I find that hard to believe with everything that's being said, if you're in the meetings, but you're not an invited guest and you're bringing five reporters. Yeah. What is it you're expecting to find? Davos is a small ski village in the Swiss Alps. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get to on purpose, I think. It's mm -hmm. like a real retreat. Every single hotel room and Airbnb in the town is booked up. Every single one. So you have to stay a town away and take the train in every day. They make it hard to get there. But that lets the VVIPs feel at ease. They think, oh, we're just amongst friends. So although we are not accredited to go into the formal conferences and the formal meetings... We can be on the streets of the town, and there's lots of restaurants and cafes. And, and so if you're just on the street, you can catch the most amazing people walking by. Now, you've got to be very quick to ID them and then to think, oh, I've, like John Kerry, the uh, U.S. climate mm -hmm. envoy. I bumped into him on the street. It's just him and one attache. So people don't roll with big entourages at Davos. Mm -hmm. Tony Blair was walking by himself. Um, and so what are the odds? Last year I was there, and and one of our cameramen said, hey, he looks familiar. And I looked, and it was Albert Bourla, the CEO of Pfizer, walking just with one assistant. Mm -hmm. And and 
I had some questions in my mind and my colleague, <laughs> I, we jumped into it and we just peppered him with questions. We only had three minutes and we had like 30 seconds notice. And so you got to shift gears. Like, is this a bank president? Is this a UN guy? Like, you've, it's tough when you have 30 seconds. Go. But Avi Amini, my colleague, and I peppered him with questions. Now, after the first couple of questions, Bourla said, uh, have a nice day. I have nothing to say. And I, and I made the decision in the moment, well, I, I'm going to keep putting my questions. Let me just put my questions on the record. And the fact that he refuses to answer becomes meaningful mm-hmm. because my questions were real. Like, why did you cover up the, why did you say that it was 100% efficacious when you knew it wasn't? Why did, like, I just asked as many mm-hmm. r- real questions, not just attack-ish questions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, for three minutes, he stonewalled it. And I think the message that came out of that is this guy's never done an unscripted, unfiltered, raw interview in his life. He's on TV every day, but it's all softballs. Number two, he could have answered all of them. I didn't have any secret ambush questions that he had. He surely heard all of my questions before, but he just had complete disdain for citizen journalists. It was actually the most viewed video. We've made 30,000 videos at Rebel News. By far the most viewed video we've ever made is Albert Bourla not answering questions for three minutes because I think the whole world was riveted by the fact that this guy wouldn't or couldn't answer basic questions about something we were all forced to take. So that's Davos. We were not accredited at the World Economic Forum. But if you... If you're lucky, you'll encounter some of these VVIPs. Greta Thunberg, the Mm. child actress, global warming activist. We we knew she was in some events. We waited for, they said, oh, she's gone. I knew she was still in there. Mm. We waited two hours in the cold and she came out. And to her credit, she talked to us for 15 minutes. She didn't say anything. She was, she was actually, it was very uh, disappointing how shallow she was. She's a child. Well, she's 20. She's 20. She looks like a child. Um, so some of it's good luck. Uh, some of it is um, some of these folks will actually talk to you. They, um, if, if you, I suppose, ask nicely. There are hundreds of accredited journalists, though. And let me tell you what that means. You have to pay to play. So when you're there, the Wall Street Journal, Google, CNBC, CNN, they're all there. But they've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to have their kiosk, to have their studio. They are part of the World Economic Forum. So if you are part of the World Economic Forum, and if you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for that privilege, are you going to ask a question that stinks up the joint? No. No, you're going to give softball. So ironically, there are hundreds of journalists there. And I think that also puts these VVIPs at at ease because they know everyone there is a friend. They're an insider. And then there's a few of these grubby citizen journalists asking untoward questions. This year, Vladimir Zelensky's going. The head of the UN's going. The president of Israel's going. Like, there's a lot of VVVIPs. I don't think Zelensky's going to wander around the street without an entourage. Right, right. So I don't think we'll have a chance to buttonhole him, but others will. So the theme this year is rebuilding trust. What trust have they lost? And I mean this in, or are they trying to rebuild? The trust among themselves, the trust that they thought they had with the people? What what are they rebuilding? I think they mean trust in all institutions. Yes. And because, first of all, who the heck is the World Economic Forum? And, and, And why... And who made them God? Mm -hmm. It's a privately owned corporation. Klaus Schwab, sorry, uh, yeah, Klaus Schwab started the thing. Um, You have to buy your way in, as I mentioned. Larry Fink of BlackRock is a senior poobah. Justin Trudeau's deputy, the one who had our reporter arrested, she's on the board of the World Economic Forum. Of course she is. How's that not even a conflict of interest? Leo Varadkar, the the woke uh, head of Ireland, Emmanuel Macron, so many, uh, Justin Trudeau, Jacinda Ardern, the former New Zealand prime minister. These are all World Economic Forum young leaders. And and so none of them, the World Economic Forum, you can't vote them out. You can't even shareholder vote them out. It's, it's, it's like a private institution. Mm-hmm. It's a private club. But it really is the world's most dense gathering of VVIPs. I can't deny it. And so everyone wants to be there for whatever reason. And it's all, a lot of it's off the record. So it's off the record lobbying. You know, I bumped into the governor of uh, Georgia 
uh, Governor Kemp there on the street, if, I, if I'm remembering his name right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I was sort of friendly to him. I got no beef with him. I said, how are you here at, at this woke George Soros? This is Soros' favorite place. I said, what, what are you doing here? Like, they, they don't believe in free speech. They're very woke. What would you say to... to to the America First side of your party. And, and he said, I have nothing to say to you. I, like, he was getting into that, I don't, I, I was disappointed in his He could have given him a good answer. He could have said, I'm here to get jobs for my state. I'll go anywhere to get jobs. Uh, talk to the devil himself. Like, he, there could have been a good answer, but there's a snootiness, like, how dare you grubby people ask me questions. There was a young Japanese citizen journalist, Masako was her name, just a young lady who wanted to do journalism. She waited outside a restaurant for Klaus Schwab for hours. And um, he finally came out and he saw her and he came to her and she said, may I ask you a question? And he said, what outlet are you with? And she said, I'm an independent journalist. And he said, no. And he walked away. Why? I mean, is her question not valid on its own? Does she need to pay you for you to, to pay any attention to her? So this is people who have no democratic standing Yet they want to be rulers. Uh, Klaus himself mused the other day that AI could do away with elections. Mm -hmm. He said that what do we even need elections for when artificial intelligence can tell us the solution? They talk about AI in courts. I've seen that idea bruited as well. These are the folks who tell you that you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. They have crazy philosopher madmen like Yuval Noah Harari. Terrifying. Who talks about people being useless, useless and the future is video games and drugs. Mm-hmm. I, they're very dystopian, but they'll wind up on top. I saw the other day um, Mark Zuckerberg uh, in, in Hawaii, mm-hmm. and he's got apparently a, a cattle ranch there, mm-hmm. and he's talking about feeding his cattle macadamia nuts. It makes the beef very nice. It sounds sort of delicious, actually. Mm-hmm. So, but wait, the, I the, thought we weren't supposed to eat meat. The finest meats for the billionaire class. Yes. Bugs for you. Yes. And that, that's what gets me about the World Economic Forum. I believe people should be able to meet. Meet whoever you want. Sure. I'm, but these people cook up policies that are then downloaded into governments without democratic consent. I know for a fact that a lot of Canadian policy is hatched by oh yeah absolutely with with larry fink who the hell is he yeah and and christy freeland this deputy prime minister Mm -hmm. that had a they they meet in secret there's no transcript there's no there's no record there's no congressional record it is the ultimate back room cigar smoking club and they don't deny it they brag about it i know schwab himself uh, boasts about penetrating the cabinets yes I don't, you've, we've got to fight back. And the fact that they realize that they've lost institutional trust, I take that as a good sign. But they're but what, on their agenda. So, what, yeah, let, let, yeah, let's just sorry. look at their... They, they just came out with their five global risks. They yeah. do this every year. And it's usually global warming. That's yeah. the worst. They do the risk over the next two years, the next 10 years. 10 years, it is global warming. Global warming's not... Uh, uh, number one this year, it's misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. Number two, extreme weather events. Number three, societal polarization. Number four, cyber insecurity. Huh. Number five, interstate on uh, armed conflict. Really? Interstate armed conflict. So war is the fifth. Huh. But misinformation, disinformation, and the reason why is because of elections. Yes. And this is how these people, I mean, they're very pissed at people like you, people like me, that have brought ESG to light yeah. and said, look at what they're doing. Look at what they're actually saying. They thought they had an open runway. Yeah. This is why they're destroying Donald Trump. I'm convinced of it. He got him out of the Paris Accords. He got us out of that. Yeah. That was instrumental, that we had to be a part of that. And everything they're doing to Trump, you can see them arranging it. They're going to try to do to Elon Musk. Oh, they already are. I believe that they, I, I think that Elon Musk, I mean, as the good book says, don't put your trust in princes. You yes. don't, but by God, he's doing some valuable things for all of humanity. And, and, and I keep thinking, where's the catch? Maybe there is a catch. Maybe we'll be let so down. So here's the thing. I think... Elon Musk is, have you read the, uh, the uh, latest biography on him? No, I haven't. Uh, it's really good. Um, and 
if you get into that, he's... He's he does things because he wants to. He's yeah. not some oh I want to feed. Yeah. He he's doing it because he wants to, and he yeah. has his own agenda. However, he grew up with a nasty father, <gasps> nasty father, <clears throat> who berated him and told him he'd never make it and really? you can't do it. And that taught him to stand up. Now when there's bullies on the block, he doesn't bend the knee. He doesn't bend the knee. And the harder you push him, wow. the harder he'll fight. I did not know that. Yeah. I knew he had a, a, a history with his dad. Yeah. But you know what? By unlocking Twitter, not only has he allowed all the citizen yes. journalism we've been talking about, and he wants to make it a commercial place as well. It's a, and it's very exciting, but it's also revealed the depth of the control. Oh, yeah. The misinformation. Here's misinformation. a guy who's done more for global warming, if you believe that. Yeah. There's no one on earth that yeah. has done more than him, yeah. and they hate him. It's, it's fascinating that misinformation, yeah, I think you're right that that will be their entry into censorship in this election year. Mm. And that will, f- and some of these names I've mentioned, um, like Jacinda Ardern, she was, she's no longer the prime minister of New Zealand, but she still is a policymaker mm-hmm. jetting around her chief uh, project right now is censorship online. And and Leo Varadkar of Ireland, I don't know if you've seen some of the crazy stuff they're talking about there, oh, yeah. merely possessing hate speech, which they include like uh, politically incorrect memes on your phone or something, merely the possession of them will be a crime. I'm worried. And, and people say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. It's not. They're saying it out loud. Yes. You know, it, I find that people... For all those people that said it was a conspiracy theory with ESG, where are you now? Yeah. And the funny thing is, if you support eating bugs, the misinformation censorship, if you support all the things they're doing, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's good policy. If you oppose it, well, then they call you a conspiracy theorist. I, you know, we talk about... The thing about being citizen journalists is you, is you follow alternative contrarian leads a lot, nonconformist. And the thing is, a lot of alternative nonconformist ideas are wrong. It's just a fact. The internet is full of wrong things. You have to discern what's, I mean, but that doesn't mean everything is false. Jeffrey Epstein was called a false rumor for the longest time, and, and we're learning more about it all the time. But what I tell my, my team, because we've got a lot, a lot of young guys doing journalism, I say follow the facts wherever they lead, as in don't be averse to throwing your theory out if if the facts reject it. But the world is crazy enough. We don't have to invent conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. There's enough craziness out there just lying out there that people aren't reporting. Just go and show it. Just go and show with the camera who is there at Davos and why. And just being there is half the battle. I think, I mean, I love opinion journalism. You can see I've got a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. But I think... Uh, the most important work we've ever done at Rebel News Fact. is in the field, just to show things. I, I remember you interviewed me when I was in Marseille, France, mm-hmm. during the race riots there. Mm-hmm. And just talking to all these Algerian Muslim men, not women, because they weren't on the streets. Just if you don't go and see them and talk to them, you, you, you won't really get a feeling for what's going on. And, and I think that th- that's the beauty of citizen journalism because it's distributed. It's people with their cell phones everywhere in the world. And I think in, in some way, misinformation, disinformation, we're in a golden age of journalism. When you look at it, everyone can be a journalist. You have more cameras recording things than ever before. You have people from, you know, you want to talk about diversity. How about real diversity? Different people can show you what's going on. Now, you've got to use your decision. You've got to use your intellect to determine what's real and what's fake. But in a way, we're in the golden age of journalism. That's what these folks want to stop. That's what the old Twitter was stopping. That's what uh, shadow banning and de-boosting was all about. That's, what, that's the thing they hate most about Elon Musk. They, they don't really hate that he's quirky or that he's a contrarian. They mm. hate that he has freed Twitter and exposed their censorship. That's his greatest gift to the world. He has, in a way, brought the First Amendment to the whole world, including to places like Canada, which don't have a First Amendment. You, you were a happy warrior for a long time. You know, you... You did interviews with, you know, naked 
people and they blurred your nipples and i mean you were you were a showman as well and you it was fun it was fun um you're just a warrior now you're just a warrior i try and keep my sense of humor um but things feel darker now and the battles feel so much more important. I mean, for for the longest time, everything was frozen in ice. I mean, during the Cold War, everything was fr- foreign affairs seemed frozen. Um, the debates seemed like the spectrum of outcomes seemed smaller. Now I like I can't think of a more catastrophic difference between Biden and Trump, for example. I mean, look at the world. Look what's happening in the world. And. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I don't think I'm, like, I, I think I still do have a sense of humor. I also have the obligations of being, uh, I guess, in my own way, a CEO. I mean, we've got just over yeah. 40 people at the company. So a lot of what I do, it, I loved being just a commentator or just a journalist. I didn't have to worry about the dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to worry about censorship by YouTube. I mean, we were the largest YouTube news channel in Canada. After one year, of, we, we were growing 8% a month. We were on track to make a million bucks in our second year just in YouTube ads. That's, you can build a company with that. And then YouTube turned it off because we were pro-Trump and, and I'm, I wouldn't doubt that the government of Canada weighed in. So how do you make a go of it? How do you start a media company? You either have an oligarch like Jeff Bezos in the Washington Post or Carlos Slim in the New York Times. I, I mean, it's a good gig if you can get it, but you better be very obedient and not mm-hmm. step on his toes and he might get bored of his plaything. Mm-hmm. So an oligarch is out. Okay, you could work for the government. That's what most journalists in Canada do. You could work for a big corporate conglomerate, but then all you can do is vanilla because they're too risk averse. Or you can try and live off the support of your people through subscriptions or we do a lot of crowdfunding. That is a very hard way to make a living in Canada because we don't have a big base. I think we do good work, but our, our market is one-tenth the size of America. But, but we are, our staff can't be one-tenth the size. We don't have the economy of scale. I think maybe that's one reason why I'm not quite as jokey you know, in my, in my ripe old age as I was 15 years ago when I just had fun writing things. Mm-hmm. But, but you have to keep your sense of humor. And... You know, Orwell and others talked about it. You know, Solzhenitsyn was sent to jail for making a joke about about Stalin's mustache. Khomeini said there's no jokes in Islam, uh, the Ayatollah. And and I think you have to stay irreverent. You have to you do have to laugh. And at the end of the day, the if you can laugh at power, if you can laugh at the tyrant, if you can mock Justin Trudeau, that not only will you feel better, but that's there's no defense to being mocked and laughed at for a politician. They lose their aura of inevitability. And, and uh, I just think that every tyrant in history hates being laughed at. And I think Trudeau is that way too. And we make a lot of fun of him. My, my book, The Lebranos, I wrote a book about Justin Trudeau. But, you know, the cover, The Lebranos, it was sort of a takeoff of The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. And we had sort of that movie poster look of Trudeau looking really mean. That drove him nuts. It made him crazy. I was prosecuted for that book. I'm the only author in Canadian history who was prosecuted for a book. There were 24 books published about Justin Trudeau in the 2019 election. 24 books. It's not surprising. There were 100 books on Trump. Mine was the only critical book. There were 23 pro-Trudeau books, and then there was mine. Elections Canada, which is our FEC, investigated me. They hauled me down to their office. They had two 30-year Mounties in, in, interrogate me about my book for an hour. And I said, I'm an author. I don't have to. I, mean, I went down there because I, I wanted to record them. They said, why didn't you register this book with the government? I said, because I'm an author. I don't register books. They said, but it's a campaign ad because it's so clearly critical of Trudeau. I mean, look at the cover. They were obsessed by the cover of the book. It was a, it was a humorous, satirical comparison of Justin Trudeau and his cronies with The Sopranos. And that tells me if I can stay humorous, if I can stay light, that will drive the other side mad. But... Boy, jokes are the first thing to go, aren't they? I mean, ask ask the funniest comedians. 
they won't do the campus circuit anymore because the jokes are the first thing to go because every joke is a little revolution. Every joke is a, you, you, you're dealing with a sensitive issue and you're not allowed to do that. You can't make a joke about transgenderism. You can't make a joke about wokeism. The guy who, um, Kurt Garan, do you know that name? Kurt Garan was uh, a combination of uh, Robin Williams and Tom Hanks. Um, he was the number one guy, trusted, always played a dad or a good guy, um, but was, was very, very funny. And in the 1920s, he started making fun of the Nazis. And he was extraordinarily popular and hid right in the spotlight. Huh. And um, 1933 comes around, and uh, they march in, and they say, all the Jews, you're all fired. And uh, Garan said, you can't do this. And they said, that means you, too, get out. He was Jewish. He um, left, he saw what was coming, so he went to Paris. Um, Hitler hated him so much hmm. because he made fun of him. Hmm. Hated him so much. When they went into Paris, one of the, the first things that they were ordered to do was find him. Hmm. They found him uh, and put him on a train. I can't remember the the name of the town that they stopped in, but it was a town that had been cut in half and uh, it had all of the intellectuals. He saved all of the intellectuals, all the famous Jews, hmm. all the orchestra, the doctors, everything else. And um, he was brought there and given a choice. You can go to Auschwitz now or, uh, uh, or you'll make a film. And he said, I'm not going to make a film. And they said, okay, we forgot to tell you, we're going to send every person in this town to Auschwitz and then you. Hmm. And uh, so he made the film and it was called A Place for the Jews. Really? And it answered the question for most Germans, what happened to all these people? Wow. They just disappeared. What happened? It is the most terrifying film you've ever seen if you watch it because it's happy. Wow. It shows Jews eating and making things and laughing and listening at concerts and all of it. Hmm. They were beaten. If you took and took the spoon and actually put something in your mouth, you had to spit it out or you were beaten. Hmm. Okay. In the end, film came out. Soon as he said, print, and they had the edit, they rounded up everybody and him yeah. and sent him away. You're right. Uh, dictators hate being made fun of. They hate. But it is the best way to expose them. You know, I know Charlie Chaplin, of course, the dictator. But at the end of the day, you need more than that. Because how did, how did all of those stories end? Mm -hmm. This French actor was sent off anyways. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Chaplin, I mean... That didn't stop Hitler. I, I think it's important to mock, to mock uh, the tyrant, but we do need action also, and I'm very worried about that. I don't know. I think that the world is. I I don't know how it gets back on track. I think it's a it's a terrible combination. The leaders we have around the world, I, every one of them weaker than the next. I see little twinkles of hope, but they seem minor. Kurt Wilders in Holland mm -hmm. won the Dutch elections mm -hmm. there um, on, on a platform of pulling out of the madness of the European Union and, and stopping mass immigration. And, you know, he, I, I interviewed him in the Netherlands. You know, we talk about carbon net zero here. Mm -hmm. He's talking about nitrogen net zero. That, that's the war on farmers that I they know. have in Europe. That's no fertilizer. It was crazy. Like he was talking about nitrogen. I said, what are you talking about? But imagine the madness, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the hubris mm -hmm. of, of these Larry Finks and, uh, mm -hmm. and others. They're going to ban literally a chemical from the periodic table of the elements. 
We're going to take out carbon. We're going to take out nitrogen. Nitrogen is most of air. Carbon is the stuff of life. Everything has that C, H, yeah. you know, the madness of it. And and we just repeat it. And, you know, even conservatives talk about net zero. Some of them do. And we have to reduce emissions. Like these, these cult-like mantras of the left... I don't know. I hope that we snap out of it, but we are so de- I'm, now. I'm reading about how DEI Boeing is and other aircraft makers. It's terrifying. I don't know. What do you? What do you? Somebody asked me. I was just having dinner with uh, somebody that you would know of. You'd know the name. Very very wealthy. Really a an exceptional uh, human being. And I sat in his kitchen and we were we were having dinner, and he said. We're in real trouble in the West. And I said, yeah, we are. And he said, what do you think of 2024? How, how is this going to play out 2024? I know what my answer was. What's yours? I don't have as much intelligence about what's going on in America as you do because I'm in Canada and I'm focused on Canada. But America is the determiner of so many of these things. And right now, America, it seems to me as an outsider, is squandering so much money and military and moral authority. Look, I, I, I watch these Houthis, these, these rebels in Yemen with their Mad Max style boats that have paralyzed 95% of shipping. And you've got two of the mightiest aircraft carriers ever built there and 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 they're being shot at every day by all these little drones and a ten thousand dollar drone is being shot down by a million dollar american missile and and the u.s government won't, won't just smash the houthi bases and and maybe i don't know the facts and maybe it's not my place as a canadian to, to have comments on american military posture but i'm thinking America, in some ways, has never been stronger, but it looks so weak, and the world sees it from China to Iran to Russia to to Europe. And I and I, I think what happens to America is more important than everything else combined. Obviously, as a Canadian, I love Canada. It's very important to me to fix Canada. But actually, getting the right president in the United States will probably change my life more mm-hmm. than, than getting the right prime minister in yeah. Canada. And that, and that goes for all these terrible places. I believe that Russia would not have invaded Ukraine had Trump been president. I agree. And, and I believe that Hamas would not have done what it had done. And if they did, I think, you know, maybe this is a fantasy, but I think Trump would have picked up the phone to Qatar and said, you hand them over now. And I'm not even going to tell you what the or else is. You've got six hours. Like, I just think he would have. No, but in a different world. I really think so. And and the debt and the, I, I, I just think so many, th- and shutting down America's energy industry, which was booming. And I I I pray for America, and I, I don't have the answer for America. And, and I mean, if and whatever my thoughts are, they're the thoughts of a, a Canadian observer far away from the action here. I mean, I love I love Ron DeSantis as a governor, but I, I he doesn't seem to be catching fire uh, for president. I like Vivek, but I feel like he's more a debate society guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if he is. You know, I, I, this is, it's interesting as a pundit to watch all these things. I don't know what the answer is. But I know the answer has to come from America. Where else is it going to come from? I think the biggest threat to America is who the heck is coming across that border by the thousand every day? Do you even know? And and we know it's not just economic migrants from Central America. We know there's bad dudes coming in too. We just don't know who and how many. And I am afraid of the worst. Now, maybe I'm dramatic by nature, but my God, I feel like, I feel like that border will change everything, not just a military and terrorist risk, but eventually those will be voters who perhaps do not share the American values. And I and I believe in American people, just like I believe in Canadians. I mean, when I told you the story of growing up in Canada, in the rural part where I was the only Jew for miles, I felt completely safe and at home and welcome and loved. That's because I was with the Canadians. But if you import thousands of people from Gaza, as Trudeau says he's going to do, maybe those values will not be... And, and, and in a democracy, they get a vote, too. 
And I'm very worried about that. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to just whine and wheedle. I want to have some solutions too. And by the way, telling the truth, telling the, telling the truth is the first step in a solution. If you don't diagnose the problem, you'll, you'll never solve it. I don't necessarily have solutions, but I do know that telling the other side of the story is part of the solution. Ezra, I've been thinking this whole time, trying to remember the last time I sat with somebody who I thought, depending on who writes it, will end up in the history books as a true civil rights leader. You are a remarkable man, and it's an honor to call you friend. Well, thank you, and you are a role model for us, and you were when we started. We looked to what you were doing, your independent journalism, and you also have a combination of telling the other side of the story, but also every now and then stopping to fix the world a little bit. And And I have to say we look up to you, mm. and, and in many ways we've modeled what we do after you. God bless you. Thank you. You too.